Yeah, welcome uh, everybody to uh, this week's um, SAS Stock uh, Members uh, event. Uh, we've got a special guest uh, today. Uh, not only do we have a special guest for, for the members, um, but we're also recording this live for the SAS Revolution uh, Show podcast, which I, I hope you subscribe to uh, on all the, uh, all the good uh, podcast uh, players. Um, and uh, yeah, like um, uh, we've obviously been running the podcast for, for five years um, uh, in, in case you uh, haven't been uh, subscribing to it, had a number of great guests on. But surprisingly, we've never had Chris Savage, CEO of Wistia on until now. So I'm uh, delighted to, uh, to change that. So I'm uh, delighted to welcome Chris to uh, the, the hop in stage. Uh, and there we go. There's Chris. How are you doing, Hello. Chris? I'm here. How are you? Yeah, good, good, good. Um, I'm I'm envious of your high definition camera. <laughs> I still um, I still haven't managed to figure out. I've got a, I've got a 4K camera, and I know this is not what we're going to talk about, but we probably could talk about for an hour. Yeah, uh, but uh, I, I haven't managed to figure out how to get the blurry background uh, with the high de definition. As you can see. I still haven't got the lighting right, so I'm going to get there. <laughs> we'll, we'll probably have to do a private. Now, what set. is that? A Peloton you got over there? Is that a Peloton on the back? It, it is. It is nice. Uh, uh, Good set design. I feel like the, the, we live in a world now where you call into a meeting and it used to be in person, like, "Oh, cool shirt" or whatever. And now it's like, "Cool background. What do you have today?" Oh, I guess you're into biking. <laughs> well, well, interestingly, and I'll, I'll, I'll take the comment um, or, or the, uh, the the feedback on uh, on the Peloton in the background. Um, however, I've just been reading a post uh, of yours about having a plain background in your kind of like studio. Um, mm -hmm. With SAS Remote, which is coming up, which you're speaking at, um, I'm looking to go for a plain kind of gray background uh, uh, rather than have the you know the Peloton and bits and pieces and my papers mm -hmm. scattered around. So, what, what are you for, the plain or the the busy kind of look? Oh, I think it just yeah. depends. You know, I think like the the everyday meeting i think it's nice to have some character or some life like that you know we didn't have this problem before like the problem before was your office is super um cluttered and so maybe or there's lots of things going on and like getting it to look good is really hard so the plain background allows you to like isolate the person and bring their focus in um i think given what's happening today and you know like the pandemic has caused us all to so many of us to work remotely um, I think having a little more life and, you know, it's like, um, um, set design, set design and production design. Like, well, how do you set things up to get across what you want to get across it is good, I think, but it's, it kind of, it depends on, you know, what's more important at that moment. Are you trying to create the environment of, um, like an ethereal event? Maybe you should be on the backdrop. Um, or if you're trying to bring people into their homes, then you should definitely Show people's homes, their home offices, whatever. I'm just trying to make people think that I'm a, like a keep fit fanatic that loves plants and yeah. uh, I still write on paper. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, but good stuff. I know we're a bit di diverted there, but these are good tips uh, for, uh, for me and for the the, the upcoming uh, uh, SASA remote. Uh, but welcome to the SAS Revolution show. Um, like, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are. Uh, who is Chris Savage? Uh, you know, what is Wistia? Why did you found the company? Yeah, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Wistia. We're a video platform for marketers. Started the company 14 years ago with my my best friend, Brendan. Um, we thought we were going to build a company for six months and then we'd sell it. That was our big plan. Uh, sell, and get, sell it and get rich in six months. So we're like horrifically naive. Um, but that, But being naive allowed us to start and figure a lot of stuff out. And our, our big insight at the beginning was that um, online video was finally going to be democratized. Like the tools were changing, bandwidth was changing, YouTube was exploding. We're like, wow, all of these uses for video are suddenly going to become possible. And there's going to be really interesting opportunities in there. And it took us about a year to focus on businesses. And then that was good for us because we were tiny and we were able to like, you know, we only raised a tiny amount of money, uh, 1.4 million in angel money. We were able to scale with customers. And as the market grew, we were there and we've been focused on this market for such a long time. So it's been a wild ride. And now obviously every business uses video and everyone's figuring out how to do live and everyone's making content and it's insane. Um, 
And I, you know, I just thought that was going to happen like in 2008. I, I didn't think it was going to happen um, in 2020. Well, it's good. You, you, you were ahead of, ahead of your time uh, there. And as you said, now uh, video is, is just so important within marketing. Uh, was you reading a lot? Um, I think, you know, especially like 2020, I haven't read too much about, uh, and I'm sure it's a, a continuation, but about how, uh, I think it was something like maybe it was a stat from Cisco that you know seventy percent of the work uh, the the web's traffic will be you know video kind of content by twenty twenty two right and we can see just a lot of marketers putting a lot of you know emphasis in creating you know video content and a lot of SaaS companies uh, especially doing that um, you know uh, investing heavily in in brand and becoming almost media companies and companies like Profit World do it so well mm -hmm. and you know, Mailchimp uh, uh, and so on and uh, uh, a lot of other companies kind of aspire to uh, to be that, so we can see uh, the importance of video. So you you wanted to sell the company in six to kind of eight, eight months, but so fourteen years later, uh, it's it's still uh, it's still going on. And uh, give us a little bit of a background in terms of the fourteen years later. What does the company look like? You know, how many employees? You know, are you all based in one? You know, yeah. office yeah, yeah. or remote, etc. Yeah, um, we're about one hundred fifty people. And, um, you know, our office was in Cambridge, Massachusetts before the pandemic, about 10% of the, uh, the workforce was remote. And that number has, of course, gone up. Um, and I think for us going forward, we're going to have a hybrid culture. And so we do, I do think it's nice to be able to get in person with people. It's easy to build trust. There's a lot of creative things that are easier to do in person. Obviously, video production is easier in person. But I think there's a, there's a lot of stuff that's great in person that furthers relationships in person. But I think like the flexibility that comes from from all of us realizing we can you can be remote. We don't I don't know where you are, you don't know where I am, and that's totally great and fine. But like just a year ago, that would have been impossible, right? Like we definitely would have been in the same room. And so yeah. Um we have over half a million companies that use Wistia. Um, the platform helps with everything from like hosting analytics, building channels that you don't have to code to do any of this stuff. Like it's all designed to be super simple, super easy, but like a Netflix like channel on your website, we have podcast hosting, um, we have video creation tools. And so it's, it's all designed to give as much leverage as possible to the marketer so that they can really easily, um, make videos, share them, understand the impact and empower the organization to get more from video. And you mentioned, uh, uh, as you mentioned, which I didn't know, that uh, the original idea, and many people, many entrepreneurs have, have that, so going to start a company and hopefully, you know, the dream is we'll, we'll sell it in 12 months or whatever. Um, do you still, uh, you know, are you still thinking, uh, you know, of an exit? Oh, um, selling, yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's interesting. Like, so a few years ago in 2017, um, we had the opportunity to sell the business. And, um, you know, I think if you're running a SaaS company and you have, everyone has the opportunity to sell a business, like it, it comes up a lot. At least there's a lot of people asking about that. And my co-founder and I had always ignored those um, conversations because we were just really happy and having a lot of fun and always felt like there was more opportunity in front of us. And then in 2017, we had three big companies approach us at the same time. All companies that I respected. Met with those folks. They all were interested in buying the company. And... As we got to know them, we're like, we got pretty far in the process. Like we got offers from these people because we thought maybe there was something happening in the market. Maybe we maybe we're idiots. And in fact, we thought, you know, we started in the first place to sell. People want to buy it now. Maybe we should like actually take that seriously. So we're sitting there with those offers. And um, Brent and I started saying, like, what are we gonna do if we sell? And it became very clear that like in any any way we would have sold, it would be extremely unlikely that we continue work at that company for like more than two years. They all told us that. That seemed obvious. Um, and so what in two years will we do? And we started talking about like, well, we love solving these like hard creative problems. Like we love building a brand. Um, there's other problems in video we want to work on. And we knew the type of culture we wanted to build. And we started describing all these things we wanted to do. And then we realized wait a second, what we're saying is we want to rebuild Wistia. But why do we need to rebuild it? Like that was the thing that we were like, why are we saying we need to rebuild it? And we actually realized we were both unhappy. Um, and we'd become unhappy because we'd been pushing the business too hard at that time. We were like, had kind of switched into a growth at any cost mode and like running the business very negative, um, which made us go short, like become short-term focused. 
And doing more projects at once wasn't the secret to success. In fact, it felt like it was hurting us, like we were losing focus. And so we decided, actually, we don't want to sell. And um, we want to try to fix these problems and grow the company. And that's actually what we want to, we, that's what we enjoy. And that's what we think is going to be fun to do. But the second we decided not to sell, you know, we did raise that angel money. So it meant we were now misaligned with all our angel investors. And we'd hired a bunch of people and given them options. And if we're not going to sell, what are the options worth? And so we ended up doing something a little different. And we, we decided to raise a round of debt and use that debt to create a buyback so that we could get a return for our investors and also get a return for employees. And then my co-founder and I would end up with control because it, would be, it was a leveraged buyout of the business. And so we raised $17.3 in debt at the end of 2017. Um, went through that process, which was a little scary, scary to the team. Most companies don't raise debt, especially when we've only raised a million in, in financing. Like, it seems crazy to do this. And that meant we were going to have to get the company profitable. And our bet was if we got profitable, we would get to a place of being more long-term focused. And that would allow us to be more creative and follow our instincts more. And that would probably actually help us grow the business. And... Uh, that all worked like super well. So we got the business profitable, but the company is in revenue has about tripled since we did the deal. Um, you know, the employee happiness is hap better than ever. The product we're building is better than ever. It's it kind of opened up this opportunity to realize like, wow, we can just like invest in building a company we love working for. And if we do that and everyone else who works here loves that, then we can we can stay focused on these hard problems for a long time. And then we can we can try to build something something big and something meaningful. That, that's great to hear. As I say, like quite um, quite unusual. I, I've seen a couple of cases like that. I know um, there's a company called Forest in Ireland did something similar. Uh, we, we had some angels, predominantly bootstraps. Uh, I think they got to maybe like 20 million ARR. But, you know, like eight, nine, 10 years later, they're going to want to give something back to the owner, yeah. but also the, the, the team as well, right? So they, they took some debt, uh, venture debt. Um, so when, when you so you, the team they got options you, you're giving them you know something back you know from from the venture mm -hmm. debt do you see some people just kind of cashing out and say like yeah you know thanks for the money and yeah I've done my time and now I'm off was there was there any kind of turnover or was everybody oh there like, so it was yeah. really interesting because when we decided not to sell suddenly I started sleeping really well yeah. and even though it was actually chaos like we were at that time losing money on a monthly basis we now had to climb ourselves out of um, out of running negative to getting positive again. That meant way more focus. That meant saying no to a lot of stuff. Like it, I was just sleeping really well through all of this. And I was like, this is funny. This is, this is, this is interesting. Um, and then when we communicated to the team, I was like, everyone's getting a payday. Pretty exciting. And what, <laughs> what happened was like, some people got the payday and left because that's what they were there for. But a lot of people were just confused um, and it, it created a huge moment of confusion. So it was very weird because myself, Brendan, we're really pumped, really excited, really focused on the future. We felt calm and it created like a sea of change for everyone else. And it took about six months of some people leaving, more people joining. You know, we introduced profit sharing after this because we wanted to have something that was a way to reward the team for how successful the business was, of course, beyond just like salaries going up and all that stuff, like a way to really be invested in how the business was doing. And about six months after, which was like Q2 of 2018, we finally had everyone on the team wanted to be here. There, Everyone was excited about trying to build a lasting company. Everyone was excited about trying to build a profitable company. Um, you know, and try to figure out how to make money the old school way. Like you make a thing, customers pay you, you spend less than they pay you and that's your business. And um, then it, it, it's interesting how much it changed because I don't think I realized how unfocused we were before because everyone wanted different things. And we didn't have a good barometer for like, how do you know that all these people are super aligned? And then after this, we had a crazy good barometer because it was like, join this company and get options. And, you know, you put pin your hopes and dreams on it or join Wistia get paid better, get an upside in the thing, but then also know that everyone else is there for that same reason. And so it totally changed our speed, actually. So we ended up getting much faster because everyone got so aligned, but it was quite tumultuous as we communicated it and went through that process. And did, did you personally like having investors, even, you know, 
for for a time and 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 get a benefit from that. And then yeah. the second part second part of that question: If you were going to start a new SaaS company, would you go you know bootstrapped and customer funded, or would you would you take some investment? Yeah. Is that Great questions. Um, yeah, there was parts of having investors that were really great. And some of our investors I'm really good friends with. Um, and one of them is, you know, was on our board before all this, because we had a board that was myself, my co-founder, and one investor to represent the angels. We dismantled the board when we did the deal. We eventually started building a new board and bringing more outside voices in to advise us. And we invited that person back and that went really, re really well. Um, I think the mistake I made that I think a lot of people make is in the early days of having investors, I took all their advice. And it's kind of that simple. Like I think a job as an entrepreneur or anyone is you're going to get a lot of advice from people. You have to decide what advice to take. And you need to be the person running your business and owning the decisions and if you don't own the decisions completely because you just do something because someone else tells you to do it, often those things, if they if they don't work, they're just horrific. They're just so painful. And I think that was like one of the problems that we had at the beginning. And then eventually, you know, as the company got bigger, when we hit 10 million in revenue, our investors all started asking me about it, like what kind of exit they're going to get because they invested, we were making a thousand a month. <laughs> so they, they had bet, right. Like they had, they had gotten in early on a thing that was very successful, but we were looking at it as like, uh, when we had 10 million, we thought we had a long way to go and we did have a very long way to go. We still have a long way to go. And so it was like, eventually I realized that it was just unrealistic to expect someone to hold for 20 years. Like it's just not, it's not a realistic thing. And there are off ramps to these things. Um, but yeah, I think I did get a lot from having the investors. I also got really good advice from one of them who said, don't over communicate with us because you're going to want to tell us all the good stuff. But if you stop telling us stuff, we're going to assume that it's just bad stuff. So just create a schedule for how you communicate and stick to that schedule, whether it's four times a year or twice a year, or once a year, please just do that. And I think that, that was good advice. Going forward, I, and the way I think about funding in general is it's one thing to raise money to search for growth, and it's a very, very different thing to raise money to serve growth. And I think like a lot of folks, unfortunately, raise too much money searching. And that is where you run into trouble. And so if I was to start something else, I could fund it myself. I don't think I'd probably raise money out of the gate in the searching process, um, unless it was like a wildly expensive thing like if it's something required a huge amount of capital to search uh, and then but like i think when you're when you're thinking about like oh you have a way to grow how do you put more through it and it seems like it, you believe that there's a consistent path to growing a company then i think raising money makes more sense and the question is what type of money and how are you doing that so yeah i, I could see if i did a different company i could see raising money but i would probably try to fund as much of the searching myself um, just because I like I like being in control, so that's that's how I do my best work. So, so some good advice on advice there, and uh, interesting insights on uh, I guess some of the fundraising and, and what you would do uh, next. Now I know we've got um, uh, quite a few marketers uh, in the audience uh, uh, that have joined us, um, and uh, we are going to talk about brand affinity marketing uh, as well. But before I do that, kind of quickly, so. You, you'll be speaking on a uh, on a panel uh, at Sasbot Remote with uh, Nathan Latka, who takes no prisoners. I don't know if you've ever been. Oh, I know by. Nathan. Yeah, yeah, uh, very good interviewer, moderator, um, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm much much nicer when I'm interviewing than. No, uh, Nathan's Nathan. great. Nathan Nathan's just just a like hacks. He just yeah, he just yeah. goes. Uh, but um, and, and also the CEO of Dixa uh, will be on as well. So it's bootstrapping versus VC. Uh, can you give us a clue? Which side are you going to be on? Are you going to be down the middle? I'm going to be on the bootstrapping side. You're going to be on the bootstrapping side. All right. So we're looking, we're looking forward to that. I think that's on the, the, the 24th of uh, February at, uh, at SAS.remote. I think that's going to be uh, entertaining and uh, informative. And so on, on to uh, a, a segue, not a, not a smooth one, but on to uh, brand affinity marketing. Uh, so so what, is, what is brand affinity marketing? Yeah. Chris? So look, brand affinity is a term that's been around for a long time. And it's basically... How, what's the strength of the connection that people have to your brand? And um, a couple of years ago, 
we started to realize, or I started to realize, the team started to realize, like, you know, in the early days of building Wistia, everyone I talked to is just focused on brand awareness. Oh, you build your product, and then all that matters is brand awareness. How do you get brand awareness? What stunt can you pull to get people to know what your brand is? And people had stopped saying that. Like, that had stopped being, like, the thing. And I didn't really realize that it was happening until later... And what, what was the case is like, if you're the only product in your category, brand awareness is enough. Early days of things getting onto the web, like web 2.0, if you want to call it that. Yeah, there's a lot of times there's one product in each category. So brand awareness was the only thing you needed at first. But that's not where we are anymore. It's the exact opposite. We all have a huge amount of competition. The number of SaaS companies constantly growing. Um, the number of the the speed with which people realize there's a good opportunity is uh, faster and faster and faster. You know, I think we can see this like Clubhouse, good example, it's launched in the summer or whatever. And Twitter's like, we know Twitter's working on their own version of this. And I know, you know, Facebook's working on it. And it's going to be like seven months from when the thing came out to when their competitor came out versus like, you know, stories from Snapchat existed for years before Instagram copied it. Like this, this speed that people are moving is much faster. And so it's no, it's no longer about awareness. And um, I didn't use these words exactly, but I, I definitely noticed a difference in types, the types of activities that people were doing. And then the other thing we saw is this huge shift from dollars that was going into brand awareness activities and ads to get, get their brand known into content. And really people, the term you used, I think earlier just now is like marketing like a media company. Um, acting like more and more SaaS companies, e-commerce companies acting like media companies. It's like, why are they doing this? And it's because, you know, the cost of creating the content has dropped precipitously. Um, the ability to promote that content, and get it front of an audience is now there. We can target on LinkedIn. We can target on Facebook in ways that we couldn't before. And we all, all of our entertainment and um, how we spend our time has shifted so dramatically where we now live in an internet culture. Like, it was the case that the internet was where all the weird crap happened. And then there was like normal mainstream media. And now our normal mainstream media is dictated by the internet constantly. Like that's all it is. It's just stories that start on Reddit, stories that start on WhatsApp, and then they make their way through the culture. And what that means is that we all just want, I think in our jobs and our lives, like we want the perfect combination of content that plays to our interests and entertains us and educates us and helps us get better at our jobs and like all this stuff. And so what was happening is all these companies were making content to be the entertainment and to, and to have people spend time with their brand. And that's where we realized that the, the shift had actually gone from just brand awareness through ads to brand affinity through content. And so brand affinity marketing is just simply making content that is designed specifically to strengthen the connection that people have with your brand because in many cases, you know, if you're if you can be the brand leader for the for the right folks in your category, that's the difference between, you know, being the category leader. That's the difference between success and failure. And and some of the the examples, I mean, you you mentioned obviously um, creating content. You know, is perhaps you know it's cheaper than ever, uh, more affordable than ever. Um, uh, and then you you know we see you know, the SaaS companies like yourselves and Profitwell, Mailchimp creating these, you know, episodic content and this, this content, which looks like really high production. Um, some insights, you, you know, are, are people spending, you know, tens of thousands on that? Or is this stuff that anybody could do? Any of the SaaS companies, yeah. any of the, the members here? Yeah, anyone can do it. And, and everyone is doing it. And I, I think, you know, the pandemic has accelerated this dramatically, but like the best you got is what we're seeing. Like, this is it. You know what I mean? It's like, we're, we're in our homes and um, you can have a better camera. I have this like Sony Alpha thing and you can have a light and you can have a better mic. And that's basically, you know, you're, this is probably like the thousand dollar setup. And there is no $50,000 setup right now for home. Like it's just a thousand and then 500 and then 200. And so, and then zero. Um, and I think what's happened is that a lot of this stuff is just how do people get comfortable taking that first um, risk or how do they figure out how to get more, how to treat their content like a product. I think this podcast, beautiful example, like we're live right now. So there's people who are part of the membership community who are watching us live. This is going to be broadcast out 
You're going to take clips from this. It's going to be distributed as a podcast. So we spend an hour together and you get content that you can put on like five different channels. And you can take snippets from it. You can promote the content based on all of that. And all you really have to do is get ready to research and, and do an interview and get someone to commit to doing that. And suddenly we have amazing content because this is obviously an amazing conversation. Uh, and so <laughs> I just think that the 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 barriers to starting are much, much lower than they've ever been. And then one of the funny things that happens is when you go from like high-end advertising to making your own content, it's much cheaper too. So MailChimp is a great example. MailChimp used to spend a huge amount of money on brand advertising. In many cases, they took like what was one brand advertising campaign for a podcast and discovered it was actually cheaper for them to make an entire podcast with a celebrity host than it was to do the ads on someone else's. And it really just it comes down to like, do you want to own the audience or do you want to rent them? And you can never really own them. But what I mean by that is like own the connection to them, have their email address so that you have a shot at them paying attention, have them subscribe um, in their podcasting app so that when something new comes out from SaaS doc, someone pays attention. And that it's kind of that simple. And so I think it's absolutely having happening everywhere. I think in every industry, this is happening. And the hard part is figuring out what conversations does your brand have the right to enter? And then how do you get started in a way that you can sustain? Because a lot of this is, it's the same thing as building any product. Like you start and you put it out there and you get feedback and you listen and you change the product based on that. And you change the marketing based on that. And you change the support based on that. And if you do all of those things, you end up making something really, really great that the first, the first episode of it or the first example of it or the first time you tried it probably looks crappy. And that's how it, that's how it should be. And I just a reminder to to those that are that are here with us live uh, in the chat that if you do want to ask Chris any questions, we'll be taking those, uh, you know, probably in, in about sort of the 10, 15 minutes or so. So either drop them in the chat or we will also invite you live uh, on screen to to ask uh, Chris uh, questions in person, I guess. It's kind oh, of yeah. <laughs> you, you, know, you, you know what I mean. Um, and so like in, back to brand affinity marketing um, before we perhaps move on to some uh, other areas of marketing. But um, you guys are kind of like have written, you know, about the the playbook uh, for brand affinity marketing. So curious to know, like, what is the playbook? What what are the steps uh, that that people can take to if they're not already doing it to to kind of start, you know, tomorrow? Yeah. So first of all, yeah, we've written about this trend on Wix.com. You can go find the brand affinity marketing playbook. Goes through all the details of this. I think like. The, the first thing I would say to try to simplify all of this is like, you want to figure out what your niche can be. What conversation can you enter that's so specific and targeted that when you enter it and you are, you're in it, the folks who care about it actually want to, um, want to engage. Like they want to watch, they want to listen, they want to read, they want to spend time on this. And I think it's to, to be part of that, you have to get, um, very, very, very focused and recognize that the way that this stuff is really going to spread is through word of mouth. And the way that word of mouth moves and works today is it's these very niche communities. And so to be a part of that, you just, you have to get really focused. And I think an example of this is, um, I like to make this example because it's kind of, it's a kind of embarrassing and silly, but my co-founder, Brendan, uh, is got into this funny thing, which is um, called tree camping, where you like, hoist up um, a uh, uh, a hammock into a tree and people show off like how high up they get their hammocks and then like you know, sometimes like 50 feet up in a tree and then they sleep in them. I'll never do this. This sounds horrible to me, but for some people, it's great. It's a great thrill. So if you go look at tree camping, you can go look it up. And there's some communities about it on Reddit. There's some people making content on YouTube. There's There's some stuff about it but there's not a huge amount. If a hammock company were to go and make content about tree camping, everyone in that community is going to pay attention suddenly. And it's a small community to start. But if they, if you're making like really interesting things or like the hammocks are in crazy places or crazy weather or pick your poison, maybe it's like SaaS people in hammocks. I have no idea what it is, but like something really hyper specific, it will instantly make its way into that bubble. And then if, if people like it and they engage with it, they're going to share with other people who, and they're going to say, Hey, tree camping is cool. Look at this. Like you should do this with me or come next time we're hiking. Let's like get more hammocks and go try that. And you can actually accelerate some of these trends by getting really focused. 
Now suddenly the hammock company in this example, they end up dominating this entire category. So if they, if they can feed the group and give them really interesting things to be a part of that conversation, suddenly the group will grow. And now they're the absolute leader in the space. And they're obviously, if anyone is picking hammocks, they're going to pick them. Like it becomes very, very quickly to um, build that brand connection. And this is a hyper specific example that works because no one's really doing it right now. But I think like a lot of this is like, how focused can you get to start? And then what conversations can you enter? And then you want to think about like, how can you change how you think about production? Because a lot of people get very intimidated with the production and the gear. And you just need a point of leverage. In the same way, if you're building a tech product, you need a product manager. On this side, if you're making a content product, I think you need a producer. And these folks exist. You can get them to freelance for you. Um, they work in media. So a lot of them are available right now and, or you can bring them onto your team full time. But what happens if you have an amazing producer to help with the content is that you get to act like a studio. And that means that you can have people internally that are doing production, people externally, they will know who these people are and how to negotiate the rates and how to negotiate for the gear and build the content schedules. And a lot of that is what makes this stuff go from being very expensive to being really affordable. And uh, I mean, just on, on this producer note, so let's say, um, I mean, obviously, Sastock is creating content. We we have various, uh, you know, uh, different episodic content stuff that, that we do. Uh, but let, let's pretend that we didn't. Uh, and I want to go and start, um, you know, go into brand affinity marketing tomorrow. Um, I want to start a, like a video series. I'm looking for a conference, or no, not a conference producer, but a, like a content producer. But everybody's at home. Right? Yeah. And then, so th this concept, this producer would then kind of like help us sort of just guide in terms of the vision, what equipment you might need, what the story is, like what, what would they yeah, be doing? It's everything. It's like, <clears throat> yeah. what equipment should we be getting for everybody? Should we have someone who's doing the live like tech checks throughout this? Should we set up um, a space? Like, should you actually not be at home and should we rent a space and we'll dress the set and we'll do that the day before you get there? and remotely direct you, and it's gonna feel like an even bigger, more exciting thing, which again, might seem expensive normally, but all the spaces are available right now, so it's probably pretty darn cheap. So there's, and you can't even consider those options if you haven't thought, if you hadn't had somebody who's like done this before and thought through it. And so, yeah, it's it's all of those things. It's sourcing talent. Um, it's sourcing, um, if you have um, editing that you need to get done. It's kind of all, think of it as like helping Helping to, if they're like the center of a circle, it's just like help and, and they're, they're bringing in people to fill all the gaps and help make a production happen. Sometimes you have one person who can do everything. If you do, fantastic. You may not need this, but if you're doing anything bigger or involving lots of people, that's where it can be really helpful. And uh, I think moving on from, from brand, brand affinity marketing, but just in terms of like marketing in general and, and what, what we see it does. So obviously you do brand affinity marketing yeah. and you have your, uh, you're heavily doing uh, marketing through video, which would uh, make sense and you know, drinking your own champagne or eating your own dog food, yeah. uh, a, a, as it were. I'm not sure what's your what's your preference there. Uh, but um, into what other sort of forms of marketing do you invest in uh, is working for you? Obviously, a lot of B2B SaaS companies uh, rely heavily, but not only on uh, events, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think I've seen you know some stats and people say like, you know, 70% of their kind of MQLs or whatever is coming from B2B events. You took that away. Obviously, there's virtual events now, um, like SaaS got remote, uh, not that there's necessarily going to lead in. But um, when that kind of goes away, we saw a lot of uh, SaaS companies just move into, okay, we're going to either not use that money or we're going to put it into demand generation uh, or we might, you know, dabble in virtual events. But just curious, your examples, um, like, you know, what performs well uh, for you guys? You know, where does the money go? Where do you invest? It's everything. I mean, I think it's, you know, we definitely did events before and do virtual events now. Um, it is, you know, a lot of the, <clears throat> a lot of the work we've done in content is to help us on many fronts. So it's like, yeah, we're trying to build brand affinity when people come in and we want them to have a strong connection to our brand. And you try to do that in all the content you're doing and, you know, videos and app and all those types of things. But a lot of the content also works really well from an organic perspective. So how does it help us with SEO? Um, there, there's some SCM that we do. Um, we do some outbound stuff. We do mostly though, 
it's for us, our funnel is very much an inbound funnel of people finding Wistia, recommending Wistia, a lot of word of mouth. And so our jobs are like, how do we help people take the next step in the process at every moment, which could be content, could be a webinar, could be a SDR call, whatever. And the hard thing is the funnel's large. And so working across it and making sure that it's really scalable is like, you know, it's a constant process of like, all right, there's way more stuff coming in. How do we sort this? How do we get people to the right conversations? How do we have an amazing customer experience at every moment? Oh, okay. Now we have an opportunity to scale up dramatically in a different direction. Let's go do that. And so, yeah, it's, I feel like it's a crappy answer, but it's that we do everything. And I, I mean, the stuff we, the stuff we don't do, I should probably, that's probably more helpful. What don't we do? We don't do as much, um, we really, the advertising we do is very targeted. You know, it's, it's like when people come in, making sure that they don't forget Wistia and giving them like the next thing we thought they'd want to see in their journey. But there's not a lot of like outbound advertising. Um, it's a very, very much an inbound funnel. Do you try, um, whether it's you personally or, or the business, new forms of content and experimenting? So you, you mentioned Clubhouse earlier. You know, have you been getting involved in running Clubhouse rooms? And do you see that as a channel that might, you know, could be interesting? We don't know where, where that's going to go. Yeah, um, we're, uh, I've been on Clubhouse personally and done a little bit there. That's something we may play around with more. I mean, I think one of the things I've been thinking about with Clubhouse is, you know, it's it looks different, but it's very much like you're giving your content to them to drive their users. And so you want to figure out like, what's the thing you can do there that's different, that is not cannibalizing our podcasts and our other shows while also like, how do we expand our audience versus just bring our audience to a platform? And I don't have the answer yet on Clubhouse, um, but it is something that I'm looking at. I do think getting onto these things early is really important and taking risks early because that's often where the outsized benefit is. And then quickly everyone discovers that there's something there and it, and it is very, it becomes hard. To, it's becomes hard to compete again. So yeah, I think thinking about clubhouse or whatever people see as the next new thing for them in their industry, getting on it quickly, I think is, is pretty important. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, this podcast has been going for five years. I think the first year uh, we're probably getting about a hundred listens, you know, per, per episode and then it you, you know it's just gradually kind of grown to a nice size i think i mentioned we we, we get something like 3000 downloads per episode some peak around to like 5 6000 you know and we're kind of pretty happy with that but now clubhouse has come out um, there's also something called uh, capisha fm which is like this online sort of radio uh, like platform so i'm experimenting with both and you know we started the clubhouse rooms doing a weekly kind of like sas doc show on it, uh, we, we're getting like 30, 40 people and it's kind of like, okay, you, you know, it's still 30, 40 people, but yeah. it's, it's it's not thousands, but it's going to take time. And the same with the Capiche FM stuff, uh, uh, started a new show called Deconstructing the Rays and you're getting like 25 people listen to the first episode, but then it's going to take time and it, you've created a piece of content. It's hopefully going to grow. It's going to add value uh, and build that audience. So I think some people will try these new things. They'll see that, okay, only 30 people showed up this week. And they'll quit and they'll give up. But you, you know, you're taking that bet early, and it, it's a long game with a lot of this stuff. It right? is a long game. Yeah, I, I think that that's exactly right. A lot of this is is a long game, and you know, it's figuring out how to get benefit along the way, even when the audience is small. And I think if you can do that, then it's so much easier to sustain. And um, it's the type of thing exactly like you have you have three thousand listeners an episode. And if you keep going in five years, it might be 50,000. And then you'd be like, that's crazy. That's a huge amount. We can, that's so much, but that seems like a long time in the future. And so it's how do you make sure that you're still getting enough benefit from everything that you're doing? And I, I mean, I think it's also the magic of content is it's infinitely scalable. And so unlike most things are not. So I think like getting it, figuring out where it's originating and then what the right distribution strategy is also important because- yeah. You know, to your point, this conversation is going to go in the podcast, but you could take, you could be recording the clubhouse conversations. They can be going in the podcast. And so it's like other ways of proliferating the message through the channels you already have by also taking advantage of the new ones. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I 
had thought about it, but it wasn't top of mind in terms of repurposing the clubhouse kind of audio, uh, figuring out how, how to do that. But so th we've probably spoken enough about uh, uh, clubhouse uh, uh, today. But so Katrina uh, in the chat says, loves to take away earlier about clubhouse and content. Always important to think about what engaging content you're giving to another platform versus what content you should deliver directly to your own audiences. Uh, um, so thanks for sharing that, uh, Katrina. And uh, remember, for those, those that are here, uh, you've got any questions for Chris, drop them in the chat or, um, you know, come uh, if you well, you don't have to be brave enough. Uh, you know, Chris is not uh, going to bite. Uh, I certainly won't. If you want to ask Chris, this is a great opportunity to ask him something uh, in person, whether it's marketing related, B2B SaaS related, um, uh, please do so. But while, whilst we wait to see if there, there are um, uh, any questions, I want to get back to more you as a CEO, you know, of the business. Um, and just kind of learn uh, just a little bit about now, you know, 14 years later, 150 people uh, within the business. Like, what do you do day to day? And are you are you mostly kind of working, you know, on the business rather than in the business? And uh, keen to know your kind of role, uh, you know, now you're sort of down the line. Yeah. Um, what am I doing day to day? I think it, you know, it's. It's always evolving, although it's a lot of working on the business. It's a lot of trying to figure out. I, I think of this, uh, I think of the my job and everyone's job in the organization is like, the more senior you get, the farther into the future you should be spending your time on. And as the company's small, that means like, you know, if you're the, the founder and you're the CEO, but you're also writing blog posts and you're also doing support and you're also doing all these other designing things, whatever you're you're doing, that's trying to look like a month in advance. You know, you're trying to think like, what do we need? Where do we need to be in a month? Like, I just need to focus on that. And then I think as the company gets bigger, you know, for us, I'm trying to spend my time thinking on multiple years out. Like, what are the trends that are coming? What are the things that are coming? What are the hard things coming up in front of us? What are the big things coming up in front of us? What are the opportunities that we're going to regret if we miss out on them? What are the things that like, are we taking big enough bets? All those types of things. And if I spend enough time thinking about that stuff and researching and talking to, I, I, I try to talk to a, a mix of customers, the team of all seniority, advisors that know Wistia well, advisors that know me well, but don't know Wistia well, and peers. And through that combination, hopefully, if I spend enough time doing that, when the big decisions come up, it's easier to make them. And I didn't used to spend as much time doing that and so what would happen is a big decision would come up and it would feel much more much more crippling to make it because you just don't you, you haven't had a chance to think through the trade-off so yeah i think a lot of that i mean you know um and then whenever you change something or there's something big that's when you dive deep into the thing that's launching or, or the plans that are being set or whatever and so i i feel like my schedule goes from like this current time of the year is absolutely absolutely wild so much going on and then my schedule will open up a lot as the team is executing on plans um for the year and i'll spend more of my time you know less in the in what we're planning next and much more in like where i think we should go next and just on that on that point um before we bring I see he, he's waiting here but um uh, before that so you talk about okay spending a lot of time thinking about the the, the future things that might happen or think um you, you know whether good or bad i guess kind of for the business and um you know having kind of plans for that if we look back obviously the recent past or what we're going through at the moment with the with the pandemic um you you know was that something that wistia was prepared for in a way was that something that you can prepare for when you when you're thinking about the future so for instance obviously in in our example like and, and like you know when i wrote the business plan for sas five years ago um uh, which you know we know business plans are always wrong uh, i mean there, there was no never thought of a pandemic right uh, to kind of come in or a black swan event that might kind of you know potentially cripple the business which is what you know it, it nearly did uh, but now, obviously, a bit more, you know, mindful about these things and having more of a kind of future proof yeah. and reduction sort of business. What 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 was it like with Wistia? Were, were you, you know, do you plan for this sort of thing? No, uh, no, I no. To be very clear, no. This Black Swan yeah. event did not plan for. I think we are lucky because we had already, we had, you know, we were such an in-person culture for a long time. We and a big thing for us is that we had been embracing remote work much more. And so um, we ended up having like 
we had just started to hire people totally remotely. And that was a huge, that made a huge impact because just like everyone, the first month of this pandemic was horrific and terrifying and for every reason. And, you know, customers are canceling and all this stuff's happening. And I'm like, okay, we're screwed. And for us, what ended up happening is that people use video way more, which seemed obvious to everyone except me. But like when this first began, of course, you look at like, what are the, I'm not looking for upsides. So the pandemic began, I, I'm just looking for downsides. Um, and we ended up being in a position where we had to hire faster and, and change a lot and evolve a lot. So no, I was, I was not ready for it in that respect, but in a different way, one of the things that we had done as we, as we got better as, uh, as a team of figuring out how to operate and make decisions quickly I did a couple of things and we did as a team, some things that ended up being unbelievably impactful that I think helped us navigate the pandemic faster. And we were ready for that. And so an example of this is maybe like mid to late February, um, someone on my team who spends his time thinking about like future stuff and R and D, he came to me and he's like, this coronavirus thing is legit. Something's going to happen. I think this could be really bad. I'm like, okay. And then we, created a COVID task force in late February. And their job was stay up to date on what's actually happening with this virus. And you have control over our working. So like, it's not coming to me. I don't, I'm not the expert, but we had someone who's like formerly from public health, someone who from the finance side, someone from the people HR side, and they had this ability. So they started meeting as a team on a weekly basis or daily basis. And March 7th or something, we had a whole company ski trip because that's the type of thing that we would do. Everyone skiing together on March 7th. And I'm coming back on the bus and um, with, you know, 70 people or whatever was on that bus. And I get a text. It's like, Chris, we have to talk right now. So I like put on my AirPods and pretending, like trying not to talk very much because everyone's around me. And it's the COVID task force has been meeting and they're like, we have to shut the office. Like there's five cases in Massachusetts, but there were two yesterday or it was eight cases. And there were two the day before this is exponential growth. We have to shut down. So we got back. I sent the email to the team. The COVID task force has decided we're going remote for a week. Cause that's what we thought it was. See you later, everybody. And what ended up happening is I had learned that like having a small team to make decisions and communicate and like to represent folks cross function, all that kind of stuff. We've done that for lots of other things in the business and doing it for COVID was really logical, but it meant that we, we ended up closing like two, a week and a half before our state did. And so very few people at Wistia, like no one got COVID in the first, um, in the first like few months of this thing, which was wild to me. And I, so that was like a lesson of like, I learned how to operate with this size with having, you know, task forces and giving them ownership and making that clear to the company and yada, yada, yada. Completely unprepared for the pandemic itself. We had some tools ready to go for how to manage like a crisis. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, thanks for sharing that. And uh, Elton uh, has been waiting uh, patiently. So I think he's going to come on to screen uh, any moment now, potentially. Um, let's see if he does. Uh all right, whilst, he, whilst we wait to see if he does uh, or not, uh, there's a question from Tue uh, Sutrup. I uh, hope I pronounced that correctly uh, with my Danish pronunciation there. Um, uh, Chris Savage, hi, Chris. Tue from Dixa here. Uh, can you talk uh, a bit about what importance customer service and word of mouth has had for you as a B2B company? Yeah, I mean, um, just briefly, like, yeah, early days, Everyone on the team is doing support. We still do something called all hands support. And so everyone on the company rotates through for like a couple hours every other month to make sure that they're like talking to customers. But the beginning, it was all of us talking to customers every day. And what I learned is that was that prospects would write in asking for features, 10 things or whatever. And we might have six or seven of them. And then I tell them that we don't have the other three, but we try to be really nice and tell them why and like write really thoughtful emails back. And a lot of those people who said they needed those 10 features to sign up still signed up, even though there was only six or seven that we had. 
And this kept happening over and over and over. And then we had experiences where someone was really upset and we tried to really go above and beyond to like take care of them. And that person would go from being like the biggest hater to the biggest lover of the brand. And so really early we realized having an amazing um, customer support experience translates to more customers and definitely translates to more advocates. So it's something that's been important to us from the beginning. I think it's critical in B2B. And I think it's something that everyone can do um, if you just put some effort into it. Thanks for answering that question there, Chris. Uh, Elton, how's it going? Hey, great, man. Uh, thanks uh, for you, man. <laughs> it's a cool night time here as well. <laughs> Hi, Elton. <laughs> yep. It's, it's probably- yeah. Hi, Chris. 1, 1 a.m. again, something like that? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, pal, you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, late night. Yeah, so no, I did. yeah, I'm in Malaysia though, Chris. Awesome. <laughs> You're right, right. Yeah, uh, so I just got to shoot a very quick question here because I'm uh, doing a product marketing and I was also writing a lot of influencers in terms of tech blogs and all that. So there are a situation like when you put a brand affinity. So like my customers in e-commerce says that, uh, says, why don't I go buy digital advertising and say I want to get them into the funnel quickly and activate them as a user and then just do a follow-up retention with a key account manager because we serve like enterprise companies. Mm -hmm. So for them, brand building is like, oh, I need to build a lot of resources, the time, and then they can't measure the effectiveness. So I think one of the questions here is, how do you measure this ROI thing versus the revenue performance? Because that's where a lot of our catch-22 situation lies yeah. between like getting revenue immediately versus the lot time effort to build a brand for the team. Yeah, yeah great Thanks, question. Sir. Yeah, I think um, okay. it depends on the scale of the business. So like if if it's smaller, it's it's you're gonna have to see the brands the the brand impact is gonna show up in a, a, a few different ways. It's gonna show in when show up when people write in and they're gonna say, love this thing that you're doing. They're literally gonna tell you this is why they signed up. Um, you're gonna see it in like social response to things. Um, and your sales team will tell you like, that's one of the things that I've heard over and over again is like, you do a remarkable thing for us. We've made all this content. That's completely, it's like video related, but it's, it's not about our product at all. Uh, the, the best example is we did this documentary called 110, 100 feature length documentary yeah, about okay. budgets yeah. of production and the sales team. Once we did that, they're like, everyone's mentioning this. They love it. They love it. It's so good. And they're more likely, and then you know you can see that they're they're actually there's more people closing, so it's very very clear that the documentary had that impact. But that has to it's basically my point being here is like you need a lot of qualitative feedback when you're smaller. When you're bigger, you can just do brand surveys, and that's something that as we got bigger, we started doing as like putting out brand surveys on like you know how well do people know our brand versus our competitors, what values do they ascribe to the brand. Um, it doesn't change their likelihood of purchase. And this is something that large B2C companies have been doing forever because me measuring brand can be hard without that. Um, but the other things I would say that's really important is looking at brand search. How is brand search changing based on what you're doing? So if you do a big ad campaign and brand search right. is starting to go up and you can take a look at how that is converting... Um, that's often one of the best indicators and, or sometimes it's brand search and direct traffic. Um, and then the other thing I would look at is like time with the brand. So how much, how many hours are people spending with your content? Um, and one of the things that opened my eyes to this was that same documentary, one ten one hundred. when we launched it in the five, six weeks after we launched it, there was more time spent with our brand through people watching that documentary that had been spent over the previous year across all of the written and audio and video content we'd had on our site at that time. And we saw okay. time with brand go way up. We saw brand search go way up. And then we saw customers go way up. So it, be, it was a, it ended up being like very clear lines, but like curves that were all slightly delayed, right? So like the brand search, the viewing time and the went up first and then the brand search went up. And then the new accounts went up and then the customers went up. So it became clear when you looked at the trends that that was why the customer numbers were going up. But you have to have enough scale to be able to see that. Yeah, thanks. Sir. Good, good question. <laughs> thanks, Elton. Um, Hi, Elton. Right. Tuning in right. at 1 a.m. That's, uh, that's dedication. Um, 
Awesome. I think we might have time for one more question if, if someone sort of dro drops it in. I know there was a quick question. I think you mentioned it uh, earlier on, Chris, in terms of, uh, I think it was from Harry, uh, who said what camera we're using, just a bit about the tech spec uh, there. Um, yeah. Pat, just reshare that um, uh, with us. Yeah, so I have a Sony Alpha something or other. Which one is it? It's the 6100. Sony Alpha 6100 is a camera. I have a lighting panel. The LED, the LED Go, LED Go. Um, and a Sure mic. So, you know, you put these the combo together. It's not bad. Nice. No, it looks, good, looks good. I say, still got work to do on, on my setup. Adam, Hello, good to mate. see you again. How's it going? Yeah, fine. Better and better. Good, Hi, good Adam. Cool. Are you, you in Poland? Yes, I'm in Warsaw. In Warsaw. All right, good stuff. What's your question for Chris? I'm going to make this the last one. So uh, thank you very much, Chris. It's, it's, it's my pleasure talking to you. Uh, what is your advice? Yeah, it is to, yeah, we are bootstrapped. Yeah, we have revenues. And uh, in three weeks, we should close the first seed round. It is better to uh, bootstrap and grow slower or to get money and scale faster. What do you think we, we, with the very competitive market? Yeah, if I think it, yeah, uh, my question is going to be about the market. So I, I think it comes back to the market of how fast is the market really moving? Video, you know, it's always the same. Yeah. 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 Um, and then how do you know how you're going to spend the money? And is it, you know, if someone handed you $500,000 or someone handed you $2 million or someone handed you $10 million, what would you do differently in those cases? Do you think you'd do anything differently? Um, or do you think you would do the same things? And then how many of those things are, are you looking to like search for growth with versus how many of those things can you, you know, like if you do more of X, you're going to get Y. And mm -hmm. I think you, raising money is not a bad thing. I'm not anti-raising money. Um, but I think I would look very closely at that, that. I would ask myself that simple question. If what different things would happen based on different amounts of money in the bank, and if you and if you can look at that and you have really clear answers for what you're going to do with more money, then that's usually a sign that you know how your market's moving and um, can spend the money wisely. You might be in a fast moving market, but if you don't know how to spend it and you don't know what to put it towards, my wow. advice would be to be conservative. And yep. you know, like, it's not that bootstrapping is necessarily better or not. I think a lot of it has to do with. Yeah, it is like, you know, uh, we have a lot of ideas. I have uh, about 40 things that we want to uh, do with uh, our product, but still we need to employ more developers to do this, to, to work on that and to uh, create more content to promote business. So this is like, a, I would like to scale faster, yeah. Uh, but still, I need to have like money to uh, to invest for uh, to pay for developers. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the question then is like, do you are you ha do you have a lot of customers who are coming in now, or a lot of customers are coming in saying, I can't sign up because you don't have these things or whatever whatever it is. And I would I would look at that and try to imagine like if you get these things more quickly, is that going to be the difference between them signing up or not? And if that is, then it's you know probably a good bet to take, assuming that you like the terms and the people and like all that stuff. Okay, fair enough. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Thanks, for the rest. Thanks, Thank you very much. Cheers. Awesome. Well, um, I'll make that the, the last question and, and we'll wrap up uh, the SaaS Revolution show now uh, by thanking Chris Savage, CEO of, of Wissia, for uh, giving up his time, share with the, uh, the SaaS Doc members uh, and uh, also with the, with the listeners uh, off the podcast uh, as well. So, Chris, it, it, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Um, you know, thank you so much for your, your time today. Uh, we've learned a lot more about uh, Wistia, uh, more about being CEO uh, of a company, uh, fundraising, bootstrapping, brand affinity marketing. Uh, it's been super informative. So uh, thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for having me, Alex. And uh, and I've mentioned probably a couple of times we'll we'll see and hear more from Chris at uh, at SaaS Stock Remote on the twenty fourth uh, of February. Uh, he'll be on a panel. Uh, with Nathan Latka and with Mads from Dixa, where they'll be debating bootstrapping versus fundraising. So that's surely going to be entertaining. Uh, additionally, Chris uh, will also be doing a Q&A after his session. 
Um, and uh, yeah, as we can see, he, he's very open for questions. So, so that's going to be fantastic. Um, so uh, everybody who is here today live, the SASDOC uh, members, thanks for joining us. Uh, those that are listening in, um, if you want to attend SASDOC remotes, go to sasdoc.com forward slash remote, see who's speaking uh, alongside with Chris and uh, what the event is uh, about. So you can use code SASREVOLUTION20 for 20% of your discount. Uh, additionally, uh, if you want to find out more about how to be a member and join uh, the SASDOC uh, All Access Membership um, and, you know, uh, join our, our expert uh, uh, guests as they come in, uh, ask questions like Elton, like Tue, like uh, Adam, uh, uh, then just go to, to sasdoc.com uh, forward slash all uh, hyphen access. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah. Thank you, everybody, uh, very much. Those that are here um, now, I believe the platform is open uh, for the next kind of 30 minutes or so if you want to network uh, with each other. Uh, and we'll see you for the next event. Thank you so much, everybody.